The sky is quiet. No radio calls. No warning tones. Nothing but steady breathing inside the cockpit. A fighter pilot scans the horizon, then the displays, then back outside again. Nothing. Then, a flicker. A contact blinks onto the screen for just a moment, and it's gone. A calm voice cuts in. The most dangerous fighter isn't the one you see. It's the one that changes what you think you know. The pilot checks again. Radar is clean. Sensors say the airspace is empty. But something feels wrong. This isn't about speed. It isn't about missiles. And it definitely isn't about who has the louder engine. It's about certainty. And the sudden absence of it. In exercise after exercise, pilots report the same thing. Not fear in the traditional sense. Not panic. Discomfort. The feeling that the fight isn't unfolding the way it should. Because Gripen doesn't stay where it's expected to be. It appears just long enough to be noticed and then disappears again. And that raises the question, experienced pilots don't like answering out loud. What exactly is it about Sweden's Gripen that makes them uneasy? Fighter pilots are trained to recognize danger long before the first missile tone. Aggression has a language. Radar spikes that arrive early and stay locked. High-speed intercepts designed to force reactions. Formations that telegraph intent before weapons ever come into play. Most fighters announce themselves this way. It's deliberate, it's familiar, and it gives both sides a shared understanding of when the fight has started. Gripen doesn't speak that language. In exercises, its approaches are almost unsettling in their restraint. No sudden accelerations, no hard turns toward the merge, no aggressive radar behavior that demands attention. From the outside, it looks relaxed, almost passive. That's exactly how opposing pilots describe it after their first encounters. Too calm. Like it wasn't taking the fight seriously. Gripen pilots rarely press early. They don't rush into decisive moments. They don't try to dominate the sky through posture or intimidation. Instead, they wait. They let the other pilot commit to a picture. Commit to a tactic. Commit to a sequence of decisions. Only then does Gripen begin to move decisively. That timing matters more than speed. By the time an opposing pilot feels the situation turning hostile, they're already reacting. Their options are narrower. Their mental model of the fight is already outdated. Gripen hasn't outpaced them. It has outthought them. This is the first realization that unsettles experienced pilots. The jet isn't trying to look dangerous. It's trying to let the other side reveal itself first. And that leads to a deeper problem. Because Gripen isn't winning these encounters on raw performance. It's winning them on information. From the outside, air combat still looks like a contest of machines. Speed, climb rate, turn performance. But inside the cockpit, experienced pilots know the truth. Modern air combat is fought in the mind long before it's fought in the sky. And that's where Gripen begins to feel different. The aircraft's real strength isn't raw performance. It's how information reaches the pilot, and how much of it never needs to. Gripen's sensor fusion doesn't flood the cockpit with data. It does the opposite. Radar inputs, passive sensors, electronic warnings, and data link tracks are combined into a single, coherent picture. The pilot doesn't spend time interpreting competing signals. The system has already done that work. What the pilot sees is intent. Contacts are prioritized, threats are ranked, ambiguity is reduced. Instead of managing systems, the pilot manages decisions. That difference is subtle at first, but in high-tempo engagements, it becomes decisive. Visiting pilots often describe the same sensation after flying against Gripen in exercises. They don't feel overwhelmed by the jet itself. They feel overwhelmed by time. While they're juggling radar returns, electronic warfare warnings, visual scanning, and radio traffic, the Gripen pilot is already moving to the next decision point. The opposing pilot is busy answering questions. Where is that contact? Is this radar spike real? Did that warning matter? The Gripen pilot is asking a different question. What do I do next? That cognitive gap is where discomfort sets in. Pilots talk about feeling behind the jet, about realizing moments too late that the fight has already shifted phases while they were still processing the last one. Gripen doesn't overwhelm with more information. It simplifies. By filtering noise and presenting clarity, it compresses decision time. And in air combat, 
compressed time eel. Qual's control. This is why fear in modern aerial combat doesn't come from being outgunned. It comes from being late. Late to react. Late to adapt. Late to realize the situation has changed. Gripen thrives in that space. But then it does something that unsettles pilots even more. Something most fighters can't do. It leaves. In most air combat scenarios, disengagement has a meaning. If an aircraft breaks contact early, it usually signals one of three things. Fuel is running low. The pilot has lost positional advantage. Or the mission has been compromised. So when Gripen turns away sooner than expected, opposing pilots often interpret it the same way. Kill denied. Threat neutralized. Fight over. The cockpit relaxes slightly. Attention shifts. The mental pressure eases. And that's the mistake. Because Gripen isn't leaving the fight. It's resetting it. Minutes later, sometimes far sooner than pilots expect, the contact reappears. But not where it was last seen. Not along the original axis of engagement. From a new angle. At a different altitude. With fuel state still healthy. That moment is where unease turns into genuine concern. Most fighters are constrained by tempo. They commit to a fight because disengaging costs time, energy, and opportunity. Re-entering the battle usually means rejoining the same geometry with fewer options and less margin. Gripen doesn't accept that limitation. Its operational design assumes short turnaround times, rapid recovery, and flexible basing. It's built to operate from dispersed locations with minimal ground support and to return to the air quickly. What that means in practice is simple but disruptive. Grapen can afford to disengage. It doesn't need to win this exchange. It doesn't need to force a conclusion immediately. It can leave, reposition, and come back when the situation favors it again. For the opposing pilot, this breaks a core assumption of air combat. Timing. Pilots build mental timelines during engagements. Fuel estimates. Expected windows of vulnerability. Moments when an adversary should be disadvantaged. Gripen refuses to stay on that schedule. When it disappears, pilots can't be sure whether it's gone for good or simply waiting. And when it returns, it does so with intent. Not rushed. Not reactive. Calculated. This unpredictability creates pressure that no maneuver can relieve. The pilot has to stay alert longer. Keep scanning. Keep anticipating. Fatigue sets in. Not physical, but cognitive. Gripen doesn't exhaust opponents by outturning them. It exhausts them by never being where it's supposed to be. This is the major twist that pilots struggle to articulate afterward. Gripen doesn't need to win the fight it's in. It can reset the fight entirely. That ability forces the opposing pilot into a defensive mindset even when no weapons have been employed. Every disappearance becomes a question mark. Every quiet moment becomes suspect. The sky stops feeling empty. It starts feeling watched. And that isn't accidental. This pattern, disengage, reposition, reappear, isn't improvisation. It isn't opportunistic. It's doctrine. A deliberate strategy designed to deny opponents closure, timing, and confidence. Because in air combat, uncertainty is a weapon, and Gripen wields it deliberately. By the time most pilots realize what Gripen is doing, they stop thinking in terms of aircraft. They start thinking in terms of themselves. Gripen doctrine is not built around overwhelming an opponent's jet. It's built around targeting something far more fragile, decision-making. Electronic warfare plays a role, but not in the way many expect. Gripen doesn't flood the sky with noise, it doesn't blind sensors or announce its presence with dramatic interference. It uses EW sparingly, just enough to create doubt, not enough to reveal intent. Opposing pilots begin to notice small inconsistencies. A radar contact that flickers instead of locking. A confirmation that arrives seconds later than expected. A sensor cue that doesn't quite align with what their eyes are seeing. None of it is dramatic. That's what makes it effective. Each inconsistency forces a micro-decision. Is the contact real? Should I trust this track? Do I commit or wait? 
Individually, these questions are manageable. Collectively, they accumulate. Stress doesn't arrive as panic. It arrives as friction. The cockpit becomes busier. Attention shifts from tactics to system management. The pilot starts working the jet harder, not physically but mentally. Meanwhile, the Gripen pilot's experience remains strikingly different. With sensor fusion filtering noise and EW used with restraint, their workload stays low. They aren't chasing confirmations. They aren't second-guessing inputs. They aren't fighting their own displays. They're flying. This asymmetry is where Gripen's psychological dominance becomes visible. One pilot is executing a plan. The other is trying to reconstruct reality. In debriefs, pilots often struggle to explain this imbalance. There was no single moment where everything went wrong. No obvious mistake. No dramatic failure. Just a gradual sense that control was slipping. The symbolic moment comes quietly. The opposing pilot realizes they're spending more time managing the cockpit than managing the fight. That realization is unsettling. Because air combat rewards clarity, and Gripen is systematically eroding it, not through force, but through precision. The jet doesn't need to dominate the sky. It only needs to dominate the tempo of thought. By the time a pilot feels pressured to act, Gripen has already shaped the options available. Decisions feel reactive. Movements feel late. The fight becomes narrower. Gripen hasn't defeated the aircraft. It has constrained the pilot. And this is why experienced aviators describe the encounter as uncomfortable rather than dramatic. There's no moment of fear that spikes and resolves. Instead, there's a sustained tension, the sense that the jet across from you isn't working harder, but smarter. Yet despite these outcomes, despite consistent feedback from exercises, Gripen rarely gets the same public respect as more famous fighters. It doesn't dominate headlines. It doesn't generate viral footage. It doesn't sell fear to spectators. And that raises a final question. If Gripen unsettles pilots so effectively, why does that fear stay quiet? Gripen was never designed to impress an audience. It doesn't rely on spectacle. It doesn't perform for cameras. And it doesn't win attention through raw intimidation. That's why its reputation looks so different depending on who you ask. When exercises end, official reports are careful, professional, balanced. They speak about lessons learned, interoperability, and valuable training outcomes. Nothing alarming, nothing dramatic. From the outside, it looks unremarkable. But inside briefing rooms and private conversations, the tone changes. Pilots talk about discomfort, about timing that never felt right, about a jet that didn't behave the way it should have. They don't describe being outmatched. They describe being unsettled. Gripen doesn't dominate headlines because it doesn't create moments meant to be seen. It doesn't force dramatic merges or high-energy showcases. Its victories don't arrive with visual confirmation. They arrive as quiet realizations. That the fight never unfolded on equal terms. That decisions felt delayed. That options seem to vanish without warning. Gripen dominates situations, not screens. And that's why the fear stays quiet. Professionals understand that broadcasting discomfort invites questions. It challenges assumptions. It suggests vulnerability. So the language stays controlled. The respect is implied, not announced. But the pattern repeats. Pilots leave exercises with grip and surprised by how much mental effort the encounter demanded. Not because the jet was louder or faster, but because it thought faster. Because it could disengage and return without penalty. Because it forced uncertainty where confidence should have existed. Because it attacked the pilot's decision-making rather than the aircraft's limits. That kind of advantage doesn't translate into dramatic footage. It translates into hesitation. And er hesitais. Tian is what pilots are trained to avoid. In the end, Gripen's strength lies in something that doesn't photograph well. It reshapes understanding. It changes how pilots interpret the sky, how they trust their instruments, how they commit to decisions. That's why the fear remains understated, and why it endures. In air combat, fear isn't triggered by what you see. It's triggered by what you stop understanding.